This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Church Street United Methodist Church proudly presents Rejoice. Good morning and welcome to Rejoice, the weekly devotional program brought to you by Church Street United Methodist Church in Knoxville, Tennessee. I'm Palmer Cantler, an associate pastor at Church Street United Methodist Church. Our scripture reading today is John chapter 2, verses 1 through 11, and I hope you will get your Bibles and read along with me. But first, let's listen as our parish adult choir sing, presents Sing Unto God. Sing, sing, sing unto God, sing, sing, sing. join me in reading John chapter 2 verses 1 through 11. On the third day there was a wedding in Cana of Galilee and the mother of Jesus was there. Jesus and his disciples had also been invited to the wedding. When the wine gave out the mother of Jesus said to him they have no wine and Jesus said to her woman what concern is that to you and to me my hour has not yet come. His mother said to the servants, do whatever he tells you. Now standing there were six stone water jars for the Jewish rites of purification, each holding 20 or 30 gallons. Jesus said to them, fill the jars with water, and they filled them up to the brim. He said to them, now draw some out and take it to the chief steward. So they took it. When the steward tasted the water that had become wine and did not know where it came from, though the servants who had drawn the water knew, the steward called the bridegroom and said to him, Everyone serves the good wine first and then the inferior wine after the guests have become drunk. But you have kept the good wine until now. Jesus did this, the first of his signs in Cana of Galilee, and revealed his glory and his disciples believed in him. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Will you pray with me? God of miracles, you sent your son, Je your son Jesus began his ministry by performing signs of his glory that continue to astound us. Guide us by the Holy Spirit as we seek to live out your fa our faith in you so that the world might know the divine abundance of your love. May you be present in our worship and lead my words to be a sign of your glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 2019 marks an incredible anniversary. For 150 years, the United Methodist women have embodied faith, hope, and love in action. These women have served as missionaries around the world, teaching classes and providing education in communities that needed help. They have come together for book studies and discussion groups, seeking to learn together and grow deeper in their faith. They have provided meals, clothing, and shelters to homeless families. 
For 150 years, the United Methodist women have advocated for fair labor practices, environmental stewardship, and empowerment of women, children, and youth. For 150 years, these women have been an incredible force for the kingdom of God. When we sat down to plan today's worship service, I asked Verna McLean and Elaine Ralston, our church's UMW president and vice president respectively, about how, why they felt called to the UMW. Both told me stories of the ways the UMW has been able to support our local community and care for the world. But Elaine summed it up wonderfully when she described the power of the UMW. She said, women see a problem and they jump into action to fix it. We get the job done. And I truly do not think I could have said it better myself. For 150 years, the United Methodist women that we celebrate today have gotten the job done. From the scripture this morning, we can tell that our UMW come by their perseverance, honestly. The Gospel of John gives us a peek into Jesus at a wedding feast. A little historical background tells us that wedding feasts during the Roman age would last seven days. So on the third day of this great celebration, the hosts have run out of wine. The party is about to come to a crashing halt. A joyful celebration and they have run out of wine. The mother of Jesus is the one who brings it to our attention. While we know her, her name is Mary, the Gospel of John only refers to her as the mother of Jesus. There is a scarcity at this party. Celebrations are times of abundant food, joy-filled laughter, and sharing the best to reveal, revel in the occasion. Yet something's happened. And there is scarcity. In the midst of abundance and generosity, suddenly there is a shortage and the celebration could be about to stop. Mary walks up to Jesus to tell him, there is no wine. The host never plans to run out of something. As someone planning a wedding myself, this passage struck a real chord of fear in my planning skills. We prepare for abundance for there always to be enough, for our guests never to go hungry, for our children to never experience thirst. We as people of God believe in divine abundance. We hear the stories of lands flowing with milk and honey promised to the Israelites and Jesus feeding the 5,000s with baskets to spare. We work to plan celebrations of our own that might be times of joy and excitement. Moments where our hearts are brimming over with love and hope for the future. We save money and work hard to afford that mortgage. We make sure that our children have the books and tools they need to succeed in school. We get the car that will keep our family safe during travel. We keep making those insurance payments, hoping we never have to use it. We purchase more food than we need, just in case the kids are extra hungry one night. We strive to have abundance and hold to the safety that it seems to afford. But like in our scripture, something happens. Maybe for no fault of our own, you get hurt in an accident then that insurance won't cover as much as you had hoped. Or a relationship ends and that house morphs from a home to a bargaining chip. Or the children are struggling to read and can't keep up in school, leading to further discouragement and get more and more behind. Or that perfect job comes crashing down when you get laid off. Even right now, we can think specifically of the unexpected fear many of the families of government employees must be fearing. What happens when you get furloughed and might not be able to pay your bills, let alone feed your family? We can easily look around and see scarcity. It is all around us. 
in the midst of our belief in a divine abundance, we come face to face with the harsh realities of this world. People are still hungry and thirsty and struggling to get by. Mary is the one who brought Jesus face to face with scarcity in that moment. She nudges him saying, there is no wine. It is easy in our current context to hear Jesus' response to her as rude. He retorts back to her, Woman, what concern is that to you and to me? My hour has not yet come. In this moment, he distances himself from the problem and her request. We could make grand theological arguments about Jesus waiting for the divine time to begin his ministry. But his question is one we all have in the face of someone else's scarcity. What concern is that to you and to me? Why is this my problem? Why should I care about your lack? But Mary knew something. She doesn't answer Jesus. She doesn't nag him that now would be the grand time to make his grand entrance with a miracle. Her response is not towards him. She steps into action. Mary turns to the servants and instructs them to do whatever Jesus says. She knows Jesus will respond. And maybe if she didn't firmly know, she had faith that he would. In this story, Mary, the mother of Jesus, is a catalyst to Jesus' extravagant generosity. She saw the problem of scarcity and wanted to do something about it. She went to someone she knew could help and got to work, making sure that the job got done. She is this prodding towards divine generosity. It is in Mary's prodding that I see the 150 year legacy of the United Methodist women. Time and time again, these women have seen a problem in society and stepped in to do something about it. Knowing that they are not the source of divine abundance, they prepare the way for God to do great things by getting involved in their communities and building relationships around the world. The legacy of the United Methodist Women is women who have seen a problem and believe that they are called to do something about it. Whether it is to relieve spiritual scarcity in our devotional lives or physical scarcity in not having enough food, these women have made it their purpose, quote, to know God and to experience freedom as whole persons through Jesus Christ, to develop creative, supportive fellowship, and to expand concepts of mission through participation in the global ministries of the world. United Methodist women get the job done and follow in the steps of Mary to be catalysts of Jesus' extravagant generosity. I think specifically about the Wesley House. When I think of the way the United Methodist women of this church saw a problem and stepped in to be a catalyst in the name of Christ. At the beginning of the 20th century, women from this congregation noticed a problem. They saw children sitting outside the factory of Brookside Mills, waiting for their mothers to get off work. These mothers were doing what they could to provide for their families, but still had to deal with the scarcity of a lack of childcare. So the women of this church stepped in. They raised money and made plans, and most importantly, prayed for God to provide. In 1907, these women founded the Wesley House to meet an important need in their community. 110 years later, this ministry still provides essential help and divine generosity to students and senior adults here in Knoxville. Mary prodded Jesus. She saw a problem. 
and helped to set the conditions because she believed in divine generosity. She believed that God is a God of abundance, especially in the midst of, genero- of scarcity. Sometimes our abundance doesn't look like a miracle of water being turned into wine. Sometimes the divine generosity and abundance is in the sharing of resources to feed and clothe our neighbors, support missionaries in foreign lands, and build relationships to support our faith journey. The United Methodist Women has 150 years of seeing the needs and scarcities of this world, praying over them and then getting to work to be part of God's solution. This year, as they celebrate 150 years of being catalysts of divine generosity, may we also celebrate how the UMW are women who get the job done. What will the next 150 years bring? As we celebrate the United Methodist women and their legacy this morning, I would like to share a little about their history and dreams for the future. United Methodist Women is celebrating its 150th anniversary by strengthening and passing on its mission inheritance with the Legacy Fund. This forward-looking permanent endowment will provide a firm foundation for generations of United Methodist Women to engage in mission with the women, children, and youth of their day. The fund will provide core expenses of being in mission membership nurture, leadership development, technological updates, and scholarship. The total program of United Methodist Women is mission. United Methodist Women are agents of change and promote empowerment of women that is essential to address the root causes of so many conditions harming women, children, and youth. On March 23rd, 1869, In Boston, at Tremont Methodist Episcopal Church, a hundred women were invited to a meeting to organize for mission focused on the needs of women and children and to send out and support female missionaries. Only eight showed up because many of them were forbidden by their husbands to attend because they felt a woman's place was in the home. When they got to the church, the doors were locked. So they met on the steps and formed the Women's Foreign Missionary Society of the Methodist Episcopal Church. It was not an easy path for the women because the men feared that the success of women would interfere with the receipts of the male-dominated missionary board, and they doubted the ability of women to get the job done. An official of the church told the women, you raise the money and we will administer it. On passenger and freight trains, buggies and stagecoaches, wagons and on foot, women were crisscrossing the country with their mission focus on the needs of women and children. In order to raise money, they had fairs, socials, quilting parties, and raised chickens and begonias. They had mite boxes, and each woman pledged one cent a week, or 52 cents a year. Wealthy women left money in their wills. A lady gave the diamonds that were on her wedding gown to a China missionary and a school was built. At the end of the first year of their organization, they had enough money to send a female doctor, Clara Swain, and a female teacher, Isabella Thoburn, to India to serve the women and children of those countries. In 70 short years, 1939, $60 million had been raised for missions. 1,559 missionaries had been sent out to work on four continents and 17 nations. There were 1,114 schools with 3,400 trained national teachers plus 20 hospitals. The role of each missionary was to train a local person to be able to perform the work of the missionary so that if the government of that country asked the missionaries to leave, the work would continue. This happened in many countries and the work continued. The women that raised $60 million for missions, women motivated by the gospel gave their time, skill, and resources. In doing so, they set in motion an organization whose worldwide accomplishments are so great they cannot be measured. 
from its beginning of 150 years to the present, this organization has changed names and there are now 800,000 United Methodist women across the globe. It is one of the largest religious organizations in the world and is comprised of women from all backgrounds and experience compelled by their Christian faith to serve and lead in places near and far. UMW members have led the way in countless endeavors. This includes tutoring children and youth and after school programs, volunteering at community food pantries, teaching Bible study in churches, visiting the infirmed in hospitals, advocating against lead legislation and policies that marginalize women and children. $20 million a year support, 100 national missions, 107 international organizations in 110 countries that provide a pathway to healthy, productive, and empowered living. The reach of the UMW is felt far and wide, efforts having a deep and lasting impact on the lives of women and children and youth each and every day. We want to continue to give full voice to every woman and child and youth to speak to themselves, to express concern for each other and develop women leaders, to empower every member to be active in these times of need and plenty, to live out the gospel and believe in the promises of God. We must pass on this great mission legacy because in the 21st century, women still need to organize for mission. The goal is $60 million in 2019, and if those few women in 1939 could raise $60 million for missions, so can we. We can make this happen with a gift to the Legacy Fund. Now let us listen to Sing to the Lord a New Song, prepare, presented by our parish youth choir. Thank you for joining us today. Again, my name is Palmer Cantler, and we want to invite you to worship at Church Street United Methodist Church in downtown Knoxville on Sundays at 8.30 and 11 a.m. 
We also have a noonday service on Wednesdays in the chapel that includes Holy Communion. I hope you enjoyed learning about the United Methodist women and their amazing legacy this morning here on Rejoice. If you are ever interested in their ministries, please call our church office and we would be happy to connect you with some of the amazing missions that they support. It is wonderful to be able to join together and support our community through missions in the, um, and the United Methodist Women is an excellent organization for women to be a part of. Thank you again for joining us on Rejoice today. May God bless you and your day as you enjoy our final song, Simple G Gifts, beautifully played on the harp by Ann Jackson. Members and friends of Church Street United Methodist Church, your downtown church at the corner of Henley and Main, would like to thank you for joining Rejoice. Please send us your comments and suggestions, and be sure to tune in next Sunday at this same time for Rejoice. <laughs>